very much um, to the organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to share my uh, thoughts on this, uh, on CODA for microbiome uh, with you in this CODA day. So today I'm going to talk about variable selection in microbiome studies. And, um, and this, I, I will talk about uh, a work, a paper that we um, published last year, uh, together with Tony Susin, Eva Wong, and Kiman Lecao at NAR Genomics. And um, variable selection, uh, in this case, uh, we focus on the characterization of what is called microbial dysbiosis. And uh, microbial dysbiosis means uh, an alteration of our microbiota. The microbiota is all the uh, bugs that lives in, in, in our body. So microbial dysbiosis has been associated to several diseases, especially uh, metabolic diseases, inflammatory diseases. And uh, what we uh, want, our goal, is to identify those uh, species that uh, when uh, uh, the disease is associate, associated with an increase in abundance or a decrease in, um, in the abundance. And there are others that are not, uh, the, the, the abundance is not altered. So we have like three kinds of species affected by uh, a disease or, or uh, an intervention, okay? Um, so we, when we, uh, talk of variable selection, uh, there are different, uh, slightly different goals. Uh, we maybe focus on understanding the biological mechanisms. And in this case, we want to know uh, exactly, we want to identify all the uh, species that are altered in this uh, way or in this other way. Um, but there is another uh, goal that is focus on prediction, uh, where the main goal is to uh, define a microbial signature that perhaps uh, it doesn't contain all the components that are altered, but it works for prediction or for regression. Okay, so this is important because some models will be more useful for one thing or for the other. So let me briefly explain what is uh, microbiome data. So microbiome data is obtained after taking some samples of, uh, for instance, yeah, for the microbiome, uh, gut microbiome samples of the stool, the uh, 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 DNA uh, is uh, sequenced, and uh, these sequence are, um, classified on uh, the sequences that are almost uh, uh, identical, uh, allowing uh, about 3% of difference are put together in what is called the OTU, Operational Taxonomic Unit. Okay, so we can count for each sample how many uh, reads we have for OTU1, OTU2, but we need to know which species are these uh, operational taxonomic units. And for this, there are several uh, databases that tell us uh, which species and genus and family and order and the taxonom this is called the taxonomic assignment of uh, microbe, uh, usually bacteria. Okay, so this is important because, as you will see, we can analyze the, 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 the data, microbiome data, at different levels of taxonomy. So uh, after this process, we have, um, for each sample, uh, here the samples are the rows, for each sample we have a dependent variable. Uh, that may be uh, disease status, and we have the number of reads that we have for, uh, observed for each uh, OTU. Uh, but then uh, sometimes we may want to analyze the data at different uh, uh, higher uh, taxonomic levels, and we agglomerate this data or amalgamate this data, but just swing the, the number of counts. So, 
uh, microbiome data is count data, the number of DNA reads for each uh, variable. There is a large variability in the total number of counts per sample. This total number of counts is not informative and is constrained by the technology used. And the dimensionality of the problem depends on the taxonomic level of aggregation that we are considering. Okay, so microbiome data is clearly compositional. And I guess that here in this audience, uh, you know that variable selection uh, within compositional data is something that is uh, complex because, um, well, I, I will uh, go through this. Um, let's imagine this situation in the environment before we observe the data, okay? Let's imagine a disease that affects TEXA1 by increasing the abundance by a full change of F1. TEXA2 uh, is uh, altered by a decrease F2. TEXA3 also is decreased. And uh, the last two TEXA, uh, we call TEXA the components uh, at different levels uh, that we are analyzing. Okay, So the last two TEXA are not affected. Okay, so. Uh, variable selection uh, means like to test uh, for each component if this fault chain is equal to one or different from one, okay? But uh, this univariate, univariate differential abundance testing results in large proportion of false positive because the change in abundance of one species or several species indeed induces changes in the observed abundances of the other species. Even if in the original environment, these two taxa were not affected, when we observe the data after sequencing, we observe a change, okay? Um, so let's uh, specify a little bit what is this uh, bias that we observe if we uh, try to measure the difference between the two groups, the, the, the control group that has this uh, uh, composition, closed composition, P, okay? And then we have a, full, a vector of full change effects, F1, Fk, positive, some, some of them may be equal to one, and this is the observed proportions uh, for uh, after the, the, the disease or, or the something that has affected the original uh, compositions, okay? But what we observe is um, the, the, it's a normalized, it's affected by the normalized uh, constant, okay? that is in this case has this uh, form. So if, uh, if we work on, uh, try to measure a, a test, um, univariate test by comparing uh, the proportions before and after the intervention or without the disease with the disease in the local scale, for instance, uh, we see the effect is biased by the log of the normalizing constant, okay? And for those components that uh, with the fault change equal to one, so for those components that, that were not affected, uh, we observe an effect, okay? Uh, here, I'm, I just write uh, the, the, the result for two instances, but uh, this would be the expected value uh, of the bias or, or the expected observed effect if we uh, write it down in, in, uh, for a sample of individuals, okay? So I think that this is, uh, this is already known in the CODA work. Uh, but I think it's interesting to quantify this, this quantity. So what uh, a microbiologist that acknowledge this problem, what are the options? Uh, what can they do? So they will go to the CODA uh, toolbox and uh, they will pick one of the methods, the CODA 
methods that is appropriate for, for testing these uh, effects. Okay, so maybe the most uh, straightforward option would be the center log ratio transformation. Because uh, as you know, the, this transformation, the CLR transformation, uh, uh, brings the data from the simple X to the real uh, space. And then here, everything is, is fine. I think, or it's not. I think this is the, perhaps, um, I would say the most important misunderstanding on CODA that uh, when you are, have your data in the real space, then you can forget about the compositional problem. And as I will show, this is not the case uh, for variable selection. Okay, so um, if I do the same as before, very simple computations, I compute the CLR uh, before the intervention, I compute the CLR after the intervention, and I compute the, the difference between both, there is a bias. We were expecting this, uh, this is the, the, the real effect or the logarithm of the full change, but the result uh, when we use the CLR is biased. Uh, the bias is different here, the bias is the geometric mean of the full change, but still uh, it's a problem, okay? Uh, yeah, and for those components that uh, didn't was, uh, were affected, uh, we uh, get instead of zero, we get a difference of minus the geometric mean of the vector of fault changes. So univariate testing is biased, both when we work with log proportions, we have this bias, as I said before, but now uh, let me, uh, elaborate a little bit more this uh, normal, uh, this bias uh, based on this normalization constant. This bias can be uh, written as the minus the log of one plus this expression that depends on the full change that are different from one. So the components that have really an, an impact, okay? So the bias when we work with the log proportions uh, depends on the, uh, on the magnitude of the fault change and on the abundance of the components that have been shifted by the intervention or, or by the disease. Instead, the CLR bias is based only on the uh, vector of uh, fault change, not in the abundances. Okay, can be uh, can be written like this: minus one over k. K is the total number of components, plus the logarithm of the full change of those that are different from zero because the others are, are zero. Okay, so this makes a difference. And let's put a small example for this uh, to to see how this bias affects in, in one way or in another. So. Let's consider these five parts uh, composition. And I simulated some data with this whole change. Five, one over two, one over 10, one and one. And I consider two examples. One where the initial abundance of all the components is the same, or, uh, uh, 20%, and the other, where the three first components that are the ones that are uh, affected by the disease are low abundant, uh, two percent, okay, and uh, and taxa four and five are more abundant. Okay, let's see what happens uh, in the log transformation and the CLR transformation in these two examples. Okay, in the uniform case and the log transformation, we see this shift, this bias. And this provides false positives. We already know that. Um, for the CLR, we also see this bias, okay? And um, the bias has the, the, the other sign. In, in the other case, the, the, the cases, uh, sorry. Yeah, here you see the shift is, it reduces the abundances, the observed abundances for cases and in the, see, sorry, 
in the CLR, uh, we see an increase in the, in the cases, okay? Uh, what happens when we, uh, in, the, in the other example, where uh, those components that are affected by the disease are low abundant? In this case, the, the bias is very small. It's um, almost negligible in this case. So the log uh, ratio in this case would give uh, good results, but the log transformation uh, gives the same results, whatever the abundance of the, uh, the, the, the real uh, significant components are. So uh, in this case, the bias of the CLR, it's much larger than the bias the, of the log ratio. And here you can see that this bias also introduces uh, the, the, the reduction of the power to detect that, for instance, this uh, second component is significant. Okay, so the conclusion is both the univariate approach with log ratios and CLRs are biased. So we uh, would like to find another approach um, uh, based on the log ratio approach. Uh, the log ratio is, uh, considers two components. Uh, this would be good if uh, in cases where only two components in the em environment are affected by the disease. But if more uh, components are affected, we would like to extend this uh, notion to include uh, most, uh, more components. So uh, we considered uh, here, I will introduce two extensions for this. One is the, the, the compositional balance, the, the method uh, cell val that we um, published uh, some uh, a couple of years ago, and it's becoming rather popular. And the other is a, a penalized, called a penalized regression. Okay, so I will talk about these two um, approaches. Um, the first one is based on the concept of balance, that is an extension of log ratio, given a composition and two subcompositions uh, uh, of this uh, composition. The balance between these two subcompositions is the logarithm uh, of the ratio of their geometric means and also can be expressed in this uh, form as the difference between the arithmetic means of the log transform variables. And the other approach that I will comment uh, is based on log contrast functions that are um, linear combinations of log transform uh, variables with the restriction that the coefficients uh, sum up equal to zero. Okay, so we propose CELVAL uh, in this uh, paper, and I'm happy, Jenny, that, that it was uh, useful for your uh, work. And uh, the idea is uh, how can we identify these uh, components, these two groups of components, A and B? A would be the ones that increase, B would be the ones that decrease, okay? And that are related to um, a dependent variable. And uh, maybe uh, we can adjust for other non-compositional covariates. So for a continuous variable, we consider a linear model where um, uh, one of the covariates is this balance that we still don't, don't know. And uh, for a dichotomous variable, we consider the logistic regression where uh, this balance is here. And we will build this balance so that um, we obtain the largest uh, uh, mean square error, uh, the, the lowest mean square error, or the largest AUC uh, prediction accuracy for the uh, binary outcome. And the approach is as follows. Uh, we first start by replacing zeros. Then we check all the uh, log ratios with two components and take the, the one that is optimal, the one that uh, optimizes the, 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 the evaluation criteria. And then we uh, keep 
putting components in the numerator or the numerator of the log ratio, uh, while this uh, adding uh, variables increases the, the optimization criteria. Okay. Um, and then we we'll stop uh, including variables by uh, cross validation criteria. Okay, we, add, uh, we perform cross validation in order to know what is the optimal number of components that uh, will be containing this balance. Okay, so let me uh, explain the result or illustrate the, the cell val results with this example in uh, Crohn's disease, where we have uh, 975 individuals, 662, 662 have Crohn's disease, and the rest have no symptoms. Um, this is a uh, n number of individuals much larger than k because uh, we are considering here we are analyzing at the uh, genus level and we have 48 uh, variables, 48 taxa here. In the paper, you can find another example that is just uh, the other case n much smaller than the number of covariates. And so the first thing is to estimate the optimal number of variables that will be included in the balance. Here we have a binary outcome that is uh, disease status. And uh, in this case, the optimal number of uh, variables was 12, 12 variables included in the balance because including more variables uh, did not improve the cross validation uh, accuracy. Uh, and this is the sorry Malu, five minute uh, warning <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so this is the, the the balance that we obtain this balance should be interpreted as the uh, relative uh, average abundance of one group versus uh, the other and provides a score that can separate, in this case, separate quite well the two groups. Uh, so have a very good uh, classification accuracy. We also give some uh, information, additional information on this. And the other approach, um, the, the one drawback of CellVal is that it's a forward selection process. So it depends on the selection and the previous selection that uh, everything will be fine or not. Okay, so uh, an alternative to this is uh, it's uh, an approach that jointly estimate all the parameters. And here we consider, uh, we call it code penalized regression that is based on a log contrast uh, regression model with constraint. This was proposed in the context of the macrobiome by Lin and Lu, and we have implemented and here we have this uh, log contrast regression model with this penalization term in the L1 penalization. So this is a, a lasso penalization term, but it can be uh, extended to other uh, to elastic net, for instance. And we add the restriction that the coefficients sum up equal to zero. And we implemented this minimization process by uh, two steps, the subthreshold and projection. And for the case of the Crohn disease, here you can see, depending on the value of lambda, that the coefficient shrink to zero. Uh, and at the end, only two uh, taxa have coefficients different from zero. But here we take, for comparison with uh, CellVal, we take lambda equal to 0.15 that selects 12 variables. And uh, we can present, and I think that the presentation of the results is very important. We can present here the, the, the 12 variables that have been selected uh, like this. Some coefficients are positive, so others are negatives because the sum of all them are zero. And these are the variables that uh, CellVal and, and, and Codalasso share. So we can see that they overlap quite well, uh, at least for the most important uh, variables. Okay, so in the paper, you can see uh, the relationship between these two models because they an assimilation study. 
And uh, let me finish, finish uh, with uh, just uh, emphasizing that the compositionality of microbiome data cannot be neglected. It's very important. And uh, that univariate differential abundant testing, uh, both using uh, log proportions or a good approach like CLR, provide biased results. So it's important we have alternative approaches to, to do this. And depending on the goal, uh, cell value is more focused on prediction and on obtaining sparse model, the very, very smaller, uh, um, the small model that gives good predictions. Okay. And Codal also provides another view of the same problems. But at the end, the, the, the results uh, are similar. Okay, so that's all and thank you very much.